Morning folks, it's Hannah from the Ink Pot here. Um, I just wanted to share with you this really beautiful, still, dry, frosty morning that we have, end of November. And um, I just wanted to talk to you about cows for a moment. Look at, these are our, oh, a little bit of activity going on. Um, these are our beautiful original population, Lincoln Red. Um, who, they're very rare. There's, um, there's less than 500 breeding cows of original population Lincoln Red in the, wo in the world. So we have um, just over 1% of the entire world's population here in our tiny little herd here. And um, but I wanted to talk to you about the kind of the grief, that, the, the grief over beef, I guess, um, that beef is having in the news with a uh, with all the COP26 and people raising, a, becoming more aware of where their food comes from, which is great. But it's, um, it feels like cows are getting a bit of a raw deal. And it feels like it's very convenient for uh, large fossil fuel um, emitting industries to say, oh no, don't look at the aeroplanes, don't look at the, the big cargo ships that we have flying around, don't look at the really industrial processing that we have. Let's look at cows and their farts, and that's, all the world's problems. So I totally agree that um, large-scale industrial um, produced beef systems are really damaging for, for everyone involved, for the environment, for the animals, for the people involved. The only thing it isn't damaging is the profit margins of a very few that benefit from that. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about how you can do beef a completely different way. So here at the Ink Pot, we, we're an organic farm, so we don't use any artificial fertilizers or um, or pesticides, and you can see because we've got a lovely diverse um, uh, pasture here with things that some people might see as weeds, but we see they have beneficial um, purposes in other ways. So, first step organic. Second stage is we, we do a thing called regenerative grazing. So. The cows have just been moved into this area here and if you look slowly around this field you can see they were in here yesterday they're the day before there's their water um, so they're in this beautiful 12 acre field at the moment and every day they move on and um, each patch of land then gets three months to recover so even right at the end of November, you've got this lovely long grass that they can go into. And there's, you can see ahead where they'll, they'll go tomorrow and the next day for the rest of the week. There's um, long fresh grass for them to eat. So these cows only ever eat uh, grass or hay. They, and hay is grass, it's just dried grass. Ideally, they're just on grass all year round. But in winter, they often need a bit of supplement. So the cows never go in. Um, most of these cows have never been indoors in their life so they're outside all the all time so there's no infrastructure involved other than you can see slowly sorry the water trailer back here and water was another thing I wanted to talk to you about so we do also have a beck that runs down this um, back field boundary here and so the cows either have water that's pumped fresh from that beck which is rainwater obviously uh, or water that we bring over on an IBC when that be beck runs dry. Now we've had a very dry um, autumn this year, so the beck's actually very low. So this IBC I tow over, at the moment it's lasting them about a week, and that is pumped from a rain-fed pond back on the home field at the ink pot. Um, and so these cows never have tap water. So. There's statistics around how much water, embodied water, there is to produce a piece of beef. It's actually way off when you're using a system like this because if you can see there's 11 cows in here. They're not all fully grown. We've got some yearlings in here as well. So I'd say we have probably nine to 10 livestock units in this space. So that's a way that we measure animals um, and stocking densities. And that IBC is um, is a thousand litres and so if that's lasting them a week you can do the maths on that that it's that they're not drinking very much water and it's not processed tap water it's all um, rain fed 
uh, rainwater. So there's no embodied energy in that other than the power that's used to pump it and move it. Any electricity that's used in these for these animals, as you can see here, we do have a wire that I've just put down, so it's not there's a wire going along there. That's all using solar panels. We have a solar panel by the fence energizer, and we have a solar panel. I don't know if you can see there's a little black box down there. That's the solar panel for the water pump. Um, back at home, our mains electricity comes from our main solar panels and also from a green energy provider, so it's all entirely renewable. So the only fossil fuels that are involved in this are driving um, the, the trailer here, a couple of miles down the road, and moving them back and forth between the two fields that they live between, um, and hay production. But when you look at that, and I can you know, calculate all that really easily, it's nothing compared to the production of grain that is grown in the Amazon, you know, where the Amazon used to be, or in um, keeping them in feedlots. Um, so yeah, so the, the energy that goes into the cows, there's very few chemicals because we're organic. There's very little food costs or you know, energy costs involved in that because it's the grass that just grows here magically on its own. And then we have to think about what comes out of the cows. So we hear a lot about the methane, cow farts. Hello, cow farts. Um, so the thing about grazing like this, it regenerates the soil because it, of the amount of time the grass has to regrow. It gets a chance to really put its roots down. <clears throat> and this grass, as you know, if you've got lawns or you're surrounded by areas with lawns, the <clears throat> grass photosynthesizes a huge amount of the year. You know, depending on how cold it is, it's the grass is always growing, which means it's always photosynthesizing, which means it's always pulling carbon dioxide out of the soil, out, out of the soil at all, out of the air, and sequestering that as carbon into the soil. So we have an active carbon sequestration process going on right now, right here, all across this field and all across the other fields that we graze. Now the other thing that grazing like this does is it allows the perfect um, conditions for a family of bacteria called methanotropes that can grow in the soil left behind now on a cold frosty morning like this. They're not going to be thriving, but those methanotropes do work um, most of the year round and what those methanotropes do is they suck methane out of the atmosphere and poo it into the soil around them and so we might have a little bit of interest here from the bull so you know be careful avert your eyes if you see anything shocking so the conversation about methane yes methane is a real problem however what we have in biological systems with cow systems and stuff is it's methane cycling um, so as they eat the grass and fart out, they do, they do emit methane, but it's, um, it's methane that then gets cycled back into the soil. And actually, where the cows are burping and farting right here, the methanotropes are sucking that back in. But where the cows aren't grazing, all across the rest of this field and the, the 18 acres that they graze at home, those methanotropes are still working. They're still living and existing and breathing and sucking in methane. So it's very likely that there is more methane being pulled out of the atmosphere into the soil than the cows are actually emitting at any one point across this system. So it's almost like nature has got this system all wrapped up and sorted. And um, what we really need to be looking at is the, the much more industrial emissions of methane. So. I, um, I have total respect for anyone who is choosing to be veggie or vegan for animal welfare reasons that don't want to be responsible for the death of any of these beautiful animals. Um, but for those people that do want to be eating meat, there, there is another way that you can do it. There are ways that you can, you can support lo local small-scale farmers and, um, and those farmers can carry on their good work of... Um, of really stewarding the environment. Oh, rudeness. I'm sorry, everybody. That's a ball. So you might be seeing something that you might not normally see. <laughs> That's Zeus doing exactly what he should be doing. Um, so the other side of it is care for the animals that we have. So um, animal welfare is a really high, um, high up our agenda here. So as you can see, 
these animals are very relaxed, very non-stressed. I'm standing right beside this, one of our yearling girls here, I think that's Freya, and she's totally relaxed. Um, and we try to keep that level of, of relaxedness, of, of satisfaction with the animals through their entire lives, from, from birth to their death. And when they do go to the abattoir, which they do, then I ensure that they have, we choose abattoirs that are local, that are gentle um, and that still respect the individual animal, not large scale systems where the humans that are working there have become to become desensitised to what they're having to do for normally for very low wages. The, <coughs> the other animals involved in the system of, obviously is the biodiversity. And if we look around this field, this, the hedges are kept deliberately very wild. Um, this is a very thick hedge, very wide. It's probably about four or five metres, possibly more actually, across the bottom, across the, the width at the bottom. You can see we've got good thickets at the end, mature oak tree. <coughs> We're developing the hedge naturally along the water system at the end. I'm not sure if that's what's gone blurry. So you can see the hedge is developing naturally along that edge. And we've got a hedge on this side. And in this field, we have a fox's den. We often see kites buzzards um, it, it's alive with <laughs> with insects animals um, it's its entire ecosystem and because of the way we graze no tractors come here and and mow everything all at once nothing gets cultivated here so any animals that are disturbed say we've got voles or something nesting in this long grass here they have the time and and more space to move on to somewhere else and so it's a very gentle system. So while the the cows themselves are born, live, and then um, one at a time will, will go to the abattoir, that is actually the only animal that's really being killed in this system. Whereas large scale industrial um, agricultural systems, often there's an awful lot of other animals that are being displaced or losing their lives or being poisoned. And, um, and I'm sorry to say it, but that's often in systems that are what we consider to be meat free so it's worth thinking about the whole picture that um we yeah what we're responsible for when we're eating so i've i've banged on for a long time i can carry on talking about this all day but i'll leave it there for now but i just wanted to show you this beautiful cold morning and our lovely cows um so that it is entirely possible to eat birth, eat beef that doesn't cost the earth, but actually can be helping to save the planet, really. So thanks, folks. Please uh, let me know if you have any questions or comments. I'm really happy to answer them and discuss this further with you clearly. Thanks. Bye.